All right, today we're going to talk about a really important subject, and I want Huang to really listen and Patricia to really listen because they're going into marriage. But I want every one of us to listen because what the skill that you're going to learn today, you'll be able to use in every single relationship, whether it's your work relationships, ministry relationships, family relationships, or marriage. And this is the skill we're going to learn today, how to resolve conflict and restore relationships how to resolve conflict and restore relationships. If we never master this skill of resolving conflict, this is what's going to happen. You will never be happy in life. You could have all the money in the world. You could buy the things that you want. But if your relationships are suffering, you will be suffering. You will be miserable. Skills on I would gain, uh, learning how to destroy a relationship, you actually don't have to learn how to do that. We all know how to do that. But learning how to reconcile and restore relationship, that's a skill I'm so glad that we can develop and we can learn. So why is resolving conflict and restoring relationships so important? Why is it so important? And this is why it's so important. Our happiness and well-being depends on it. In Matthew 5, 9, it says this, happy are those who work for peace. God will call them his children. But the word, the word that catches my attention is work. That means if you're going to have peace and unity and you're going to get along, it's, you're going to have to work to keep the unity. Work to keep the peace. See, any fool, any fool can start a quarrel. Any fool can start an argument. Only the wise and mature can resolve conflict. So if you say, I just like arguing, this is what the scripture is saying, that any fool can do that. But it takes somebody with some skill and some wisdom and maturity to solve and restore relationships and resolve conflict. Look at Proverbs 20, verse 3. It says this, it is an honor for a man to keep away from strife by handling situations handle situations with thoughtful foresight. But any fool will start a quarrel without regard of the consequences. What this scripture is saying is that, any, what he said, to, to, to avoid strife, you're going to have to have some foresight. You know what that means? Before I say what I'm ready to say, I should know what those words will produce. And there's some words that you should not even think let out of your mouth because you already know, you should know that those words will be harmful and they will cause arguments and strife. And you might be saying, no, nah, man, I just tell it the way it is. If you tell it the way it is, it's just another excuse for being thoughtless and being rude. I'm going to get that. It takes skill to say, okay, I need to say this, but how am I going to say it? And then you think about it, then you say, the Bible says this, be quick to listen and then slow to speak. If you're ever going to be great at relationships, you're going to have to think before you talk. And that's what it's going to take. Because any fool just starts letting it all out, lets the words out without thinking about the consequences. Especially when we're emotionally charged. You heard the old saying, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. There's a time where you just got to keep your mouth shut because you're ready to feed, quarreling and arguing. And it's going to take some skill. And some of the skill is this, shut up skill. Have you ever had to, have to practice shut up skill? Like that's a hard skill to practice especially if you're emotionally charged and you're so used to just letting it all out and now you learn this and then your next next place of conflict you're going to practice this and you're going to say I can't say nothing right now because what I'm ready to say would be foolish and it's going to cause quarreling and any fool can start a quarrel I'm not a fool I am wise all right you guys get that so you'll never be happy if you're quarreling and you're arguing. Either you're arguing and you're angry or you're happy. 
but the Bible says, happy are those who work for peace. So now, what I want to do is just dive into some key s- steps on how to resolve conflict and restore relationships. I'm going to give you three steps, very simple steps, simple in the sense I'm going to teach them, difficult at times to apply them. But step number one, if you're going to resolve conflict and restore relationships, step number one, make the first move. Say with me, make the first move. The person that is most mature, loving, and humble, and unselfish, and spiritual always makes the first move. Resolving conflict and restoring relationships must be intentional. Have you ever heard the saying, time heals all wounds? Not necessarily does this apply to conflict. Conflict is more like cancer. If you have a division within your relationship, there's a conflict in your relationship, letting it go and not dealing with it and neglecting it only makes it worse. The quicker you deal with your conflict, the healthier the relationship will be, the healthier the organization will be, the healthier the ministry will be. So we have to be quick to go ahead and, and, and do this, resolve the conflict. But how, we, how do we do this? Make the first move. Say it with me. Make the first move. See, reconciliation is a verb that requires immediate action. Jesus taught us this. Look at Matthew 5.23. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, that means you're coming to church, you're offering your gifts, your talents, maybe it's an offering, and they remember that your brother has something against you or maybe you have something against them. He says, leave your gift there before the altar and go and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. What he's saying is if you have a beef with someone, Don't come in here acting like it doesn't matter. Because what God is saying, if right now you and your wife are in conflict, God is concerned more about your relationship than he is your offering. So what he's saying, your gift is important, but it's not more important than your relationship. So be the first one. Say it with me. Be the first one. Make the first move. I remember when me and Lisa first got married. I remember getting mad at her for something. I don't even know what it was, but I was mad. And I was going to prove a point. And the point I was going to prove, I was going to put myself in the doghouse. And I remember we had a little sofa. I mean, we were so poor, we couldn't afford a full sofa. It wasn't even a full love seat. It was a half of a love seat. And I remember I was so mad, I took my covers with me, and I went in fetal position in that little sofa, and I told Lisa, I'm sleeping out here right now. I'm mad. Boy, was I proving a point. I was going to suffer all night long to prove this point. And I, I, I remember just being in there, put my covers over my head. A few minutes later, remember The one that's most mature, the one that's most spiritual will make the first move. Lisa got some covers. And what she did is she snuggled right into that half a love seat. And it even made it more uncomfortable. And I'm acting like she's not there. And I go, what are you doing? I told you, I'm sleeping out here. She goes, well, we're sleeping together, so I guess I'm sleeping out here too. And I try to put up with it for one more minute. I go, let's go back to bed. (laughs) But you know what happened? Lisa took the most mature route. She wanted to resolve conflict. And because she wanted to resolve conflict and even make herself uncomfortable and humble herself, because I want you to get this, I was the cause of the mess. But she still humbled herself and made the first move. Now, it was very important because that was our first major conflict in the relationship. And maybe that would have began to set a pattern in the relationship that every time I get mad, I go into that love seat. Or maybe I go further, I leave the house. And the longer we, we wait to resolve conflict, it's like cancer. It only gets worse. 
So not only do we make the first move, we need to make the first move immediately. See, the only way to resolve conflict is to face it. The only way to resolve conflict is to what? So why don't we face it? Like, why don't we face, face it and deal with it? This is the reason we don't face it and deal with it. Fear. Fear. Fear of what? We're fearful of being rejected. We're fearful of being vulnerable. We're fearful that if we address it, it's only going to get worse. We're fearful that we might be misunderstood. We're fearful of the backlash. But if we don't overcome the fear, the conflict, it's like cancer. It's only going to destroy the relationship if it's not dealt with. So the question I have to ask myself, and maybe you're asking, how do we overcome the fear? This is the only way to overcome the fear and, and be willing to make the first move is this. Your love needs to be greater than your fear. And where do we get this love from? We get this love from God. Where do we get this love from? God. In 2 Timothy 1, 7, it says this. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity or coward, cowardice or fear, but he has given us a spirit of power and of love and a sound judgment and personal discipline, abilities that result in a calm and well-balanced mind and self-control. What's the result of, of using love to overcome fear? You're going to be well-balanced in your thinking in your emotions, in your relationships. Where does this strength to deal with conflict come from? The power of God's spirit. So if you're saying, look, you know, pastor, I don't want to deal with it. Maybe you, this is what you need to do. Before you speak to her or before you speak to him, maybe you need to pray for God's love to fill your heart. And when God loves to fill your heart, this is what you're willing. You're willing to face your fear because your love is so much greater. And so I love her too much. I love God too much. I love my kids too much to let this continue to reside in my life. We're going to finally deal with it. It might be tough, but it's worth it all because of the love I have for God and the love I have for my spouse. You guys get that? So we do it because we love God. We do it because we love people. So now, step number two. So step number one is make the first move. Say it with me. Make the first move. Who makes the first move? The person, it's you, and the person that's most mature, the person that's most spiritual, the person, the, the person that's most humble, they're the ones that make the first move. Wouldn't it be great that all of a sudden we're in competition of who makes the first move? Like I'm more spiritual than you. I made the first move. He goes, no, because I thought about it before you, and I was ready to make that move. If you keep this going, we're going to have another conflict. <laughs> but make the first move. I know it's not easy. But making the first move, someone has to do it. Don't wait until you feel it. Don't wait till the circumstances are right. Just do it immediately. Number two, step number two, begin with what is our fault. So when we, are, we want to resolve conflict, we don't start off blaming and accusing and talking about how they hurt you. You start off with your part in the conflict. Remember, if there's a conflict, it takes two people to have a conflict. Even if it's 99.9% .9 their fault, find the fraction of a percent. And take responsibility for that. Start off with your part in the conflict first. If you cannot come up with your part yet, you're not ready to deal with conflict. See, this is how it works. Jesus instructs us to start with our own shortcomings before we address theirs. Look at this in Matthew 7, 3. It says, why do you look at the splinter in your brother's eye? But don't notice the beam of wood in your own eye. That's crazy. He goes, you got a beam, homie? Like, it's so obvious. Like, you got a blind spot. Like, everyone could see. You're judging her for doing what she does. It's just a speck. And, and if you just looked at you. 
you know what God is saying? We all have, I would say, blind spots and areas that we need mass, massive work in. And he goes, before you deal with them, first acknowledge your wood beam. And then you could progress to deal with their speck. Be careful that you don't start blaming. You know, you know how you spell blame? Be lame. Because every time you're blaming, you are being lame. Nothing good is going to come from it. You know how many counseling sessions people start off because they don't know how to begin a counseling session. And they think the way to start this counseling session is just start blaming each other. So I have to do a whole counseling session on how we don't blame each other. So we spend two hours on teaching them not to blame each other. And next week, let's come back with personal responsibility. And if you're not ready to take personal responsibility, don't come back. Because I don't want to have another lame counseling session. You guys get that? So you start off with you. You might say some. Look, no, let's look at the scripture. Why do you look at say in verse four it says, "Oh, how can you say to your brother, let me take the splinter out of your eye, and look, there's a beam of wood in your own eye, hypocrite." First, say it with me, first, you start with yourself first. Take the beam of wood out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother's eye. See, when we are aware of our shortcomings, we will have the mercy, the love, and humility to address theirs. We have the love, mercy, and awareness to, dre to, to, to address theirs, okay? So we start with... Our part, something like this. You might say something like this. Sorry, I want to say sorry for my response. For not hearing you out. For rejecting you. For the words I used. For not letting, for not believing in you. For letting it get this far without addressing it. And I would just say, etc. But you start with something, and that's how you begin to address the, the the conflict. First, you make the first move, and then you take personal responsibility. And I would say this. Let go of pride and say this. I am sorry. Say it with me. Do you know pride will not let you say I am sorry? you be like, I am You know what I mean. What, what, what do you mean? I am What are you? Right? But what stops us from saying I'm sorry? Most of the time, it's pride. You cannot resolve conflict with pride. Pride will not allow you to humble yourself and say I'm sorry. See, pride only causes or leads to arguments. What does pride lead to? This is what I want you to understand. If you guys are always arguing... This is the core reason for the reason you're always arguing, pride. That's what it is. Look what Proverbs 13, 10 says this. Pride only leads to arguments. What does pride lead to? It only leads to arguments. So there's arguments in the family. This is the reason. There's a lot of pride in the family. Pride does not solve, does not solve family issues. Someone's going to have to humble themselves and say, I'm sorry. Now, if you have a log jam in your relationships, like, man, we're just conflicting. We can't get past this. I got a magical sentence for you or spirit, someone said magical, no, spiritual sentence for you that will alleviate the log jam. And just say this, I, so I am sorry. I was only thinking about myself. I was being selfish. I am sorry. Now, once your spouse or friend, they're going to fall down and faint. Then you finally admitted that you're sorry and you were just thinking about yourself. When they get back up, say it again. I am so sorry. I was just thinking about myself. And that's going to begin to open up the doors for communication. Do you know why many times we can't get anywhere when we try to do conflict resolution? It's because no one's humble. If I just begin with I'm sorry, you know what's going to happen? The walls are going to fall down. 
And then they're going to say, hey, you know, you know what? Me too, man. I realized I shouldn't have said what I said, honey. I'm sorry too. And then, and then, you know what that's, you know what's doing? Conflict resolution. You guys are going to be counselors when it's all said and done. Because once you get this lesson and you practice it, you're going to be able to help others resolve conflict even at work. Step number three, forgive. Forgiveness is the ultimate reset button and call, conflict solver. Without forgiveness, all that remains is resentment, anger, hate, revenge, hurt, and bitterness, which will only lead, which will not lead to resolving conflict or restoring relationships. And, and get this, forgiveness is not optional. Forgiveness is not what? God doesn't give you an option not to forgive. He says you must forgive. Why must you forgive? Because God has forgiven you. You didn't deserve it. He just forgave you. And what God is saying, the same way I forgave you, you forgive them. You forgive your husband. You forgive your wife. You forgive your mother. You forgive your children. You forgive your coworkers. Forgiveness is not optional. Look at this scripture in Colossians 3.8. I mean, Colossians 3.13 says this. Be gentle and ready to forgive. Never hold grudges. When, sh when should we hold grudges? Remember, the Lord forgave you. So you must forgive others. Remember, the Lord forgave you. So you, say with me, must. Forgive us. I'm going to show you how to forgive in just a second. But before we do that, let's talk about three signs that we might have unforgiveness. Sign number one, our mouth has been taken over by negative, slanderous, and hateful words about them. How do you know you have unforgiveness towards someone? When, they, when they, that name comes up, all you could do is just say negative things about them. It's like it's just bubbling up like a like a volcano right out of your mouth. Slanderous and malicious um, conversations really have to do with this, saying things to an intentionally hurt them or make them look bad. Saying things to intentionally hurt them and make them look bad. That means if someone's in your mouth right now and the conversations are to make them look bad, check yourself, you have unforgiveness. It's already brewing in you. And this is what's going to happen. You'll never be happy. You'll never succeed at relationships. Because how you treat one relationship is how you treat them all. You guys get that? So sign number two. Our emotions have taken, o have taken over. Have been taken over by anger. We are now easily angered or upset or, or emotions our emotions and our mouth are out of control. So how do you know you have unforgiveness? You get angry for almost nothing. You, know, you, you just, you're getting angry and people are like, why are you so angry? Now, I got some brand new white shoes today. Someone gave it to me. Praise the Lord. Now, white shoes are difficult to keep clean. Now, this is what happens. Let's say I'm upset with Lisa. I've not forgiven her. And Lisa happens to walk by after church and step on my white shoes. Now, if I'm already angry with her, I'm going to blow up and say something like this. Lisa, don't you know how to walk? What's wrong with you? Are you dumb? I mean, a two-year-old knows how to walk. You walk right on my, is my, does my shoe look like the pavement? You better watch where you're going. I see, I'm sick and tired of this. I don't even know if I can handle it anymore. I'm out of here. And Lisa's going to say, I just barely scuffed your shoes. It was an accident. See, I want you to get this. It's not that she scuffed my shoes. It's that anger is in control. My emotions are out of control. And my emotions, see, if, you're, if, if, if people are edgy around you that you could blow up any moment and they don't know when you're going to blow up, there's a reason you have unforgiveness. You can, I, there's no such thing as anger without unforgiveness. 
And if you're an angry person, this you got to take inventory. There's someone that you need to forgive. And as long as anger is in control, love cannot be in control. Let's get that. Well, they're just that's just the way they are. No, they haven't forgiven someone. Look at the scripture, what it says about that. It says this, Ephesians 4.26. It says this, but don't let the passion of your emotions lead you into sin. You should not be driven by your passions or your emotions. Don't let anger control you. Don't what? That means you do have a choice. And it says this, or be fueled for revenge. Not even, not even for, not for even a day. See, what it's saying here is every day you're going to have to take personal inventory. Never go to bed, go to sleep, put your head on a pillow when you have resentment or conflict with somebody. Deal with it that day. So me and Lisa now, 31 years of marriage, we do not, that was that night that I tried to go to bed angry was the last night I was able to do that because I knew Lisa would never let me do it. So we started the right pattern. Someone say, we started the what? If you start that pattern, you don't need to get to words of divorce. Um, if you start the right pattern, this is what happens. When you guys aren't getting along, you open the doors to adultery. Because when you're not getting along, you open doors for the devil. And there's a lot of demonic girls out there and guys out there that are just looking for an opportunity. Well, how's your wife treating you? Oh, man, you should see what happened this morning, man. And then you start going because you have resentment. It took it over your mouth. And she goes, man, if I was your wife, I'd appreciate you. She don't even know what she got. I know, huh? <laughs> Here we go. So the adultery did not begin with the adultery. The adultery began with not dealing with conflict and holding on to anger. You guys get that? So it's taking over your emotions. And when your emotions are out of control, you're out of control. Sign number three that you might have unforgiveness. Our mind has been taken over with visions of payback. We can never resolve conflict and restore relationships with a payback mentality. You know, we got some gangsters in here that never were part of a gang. They're just gangster. Like if you do them wrong, they'll cut you. They may not cut you with a knife, but they'll cut you with their words. They'll cut you with their sar sarcasm. They'll cut you with their silence. They're, they know how to pay you back. And the idea is what you're saying when you start paying somebody back, you're taking the position of God. I'm the judge, I'm the jury, and you will pay. And God says if you judge, this is what's going to happen. Only judgment is going to come back on you. You got to make sure that you're not, you don't allow your emotions and your mind to be taken over with the wrong visions. Vision of payback. I'm going to show her. She's going to feel my pain. And until she feels my pain, I'm not even going to forgive her. Really? So you really think that's going to work? You're going to make her feel more pain. If you make her feel pain, you know what's going to come back to you? More pain. That cycle never ends. There has to be a time where you say, I'm done with this cycle. But if you have unforgiveness, look what Peter, 1 Peter 3, 9 says this. Don't pay back evil for evil or insult for insult. Instead, give a blessing in return. Give a what? You know what, what God is saying? They do you wrong, you give them a blessing. So why would I give them a blessing when they do me wrong? This is why you give them a blessing when they do you wrong. Look at this. Give blessing in return. You were called to do this so that you might inherit a blessing. You know what God is saying? What you dish out is going to come back to you. So could it be you're looking for a blessed life, but you got cursing in your mouth? And what he's saying with you, don't let anybody mess up with your pattern. I am a blesser, and I, this is what I do. I receive blessing, 
I give blessing, I receive blessing, I give blessing, I receive blessing, I give blessing, I receive blessing, I give blessing. I'm in a blessing cycle. Don't let no one mess up your pattern of living and what's coming back to your life. Because I, get, I receive blessing, uh-oh, they dog me. I receive evil, now I give evil. I receive evil, I give evil. You know what evil means? Hurt, pain, injury. This is what happens in neighborhoods all the time. The revenge always causes more death, more suffering, more pain. It never ends. God's saying someone has to be willing to forgive, let it go, and start a, start a pattern of blessing. How many want some blessing in your life? God is saying if you hold on to resentment, you hold on to bitterness, this is what I can't do. I can't bless you. Okay, so now, I want to just end it with the three D's, how to forgive. Three D's of forgiveness. Say, say it with me. Three D's. I'm helping you right now. You're going to be a master counselor when you're all said and done. Three D's of forgiveness. Number one, decide to forgive and be a forgiver. Forgiveness is not an emotion. It is a choice that never ends. Say it with me. I forgive. And I am a forgiver. Peter was asked, Peter asked Jesus one day, he said, Jesus, how many times should I forgive someone who dogs me, who does me wrong? How many times should I forgive someone? And Peter says, seven times? And I think Peter was like, that's a lot, huh? Like seven times? And then Jesus said this, no, not seven times. In one version he says 70 times 7, which is 490 times. In another version it says, no, 77 times. 10 times that. And you might be asking yourself, who would hurt you and do you wrong 77 times in one day? The chances of someone doing you wrong 77 times in one day are slim to none. So why 77? Because this is what happens. Forgiveness means let it go, send it off. What do I mean? Let it go, send it off. This is what might happen. They might have hurt you yesterday. But that thought of them hurting you keeps coming back to you all day long. It might come to you 490 times. And if you're not watching, you can receive it and get bitter and angry. What he's saying is every time the thought comes, you send it away. No, I forgive them. I let it go. I'm not going to receive this anger. I'm not going to receive this resentment. And I'm not going to let my mind go over and over and over what happened because it's not doing us any good. It does not lead to reconciliation. Some of us are a broken record. You're talking about something that happened 10 years ago like it happened yesterday. Because it's still fresh in your mind, in your heart, you're still thinking about it, and you're still talking about it, you're still acting on it, and you're still emotional about it. You guys get that? So now, someone say, decide to forgive. Forgiveness is a choice. Number two D, or second D, declare forgiveness and be specific. specific. Someone say, declare it. Forgiveness has to do more with your mouth than your head or your emotions. So you don't wait until you feel like forgiving. You forgive. I'm going to give you an example. It's my birthday. And I want Lisa, all I want for my birthday is for Lisa to cook me some Puerto Rican rice and beans. That's all I want. Poor little me. That's all I want. A little rice and beans for the poor chap. And Lisa does not cook me rice and beans. So now, either I'm going to forgive her, or she does not know what she does. <laughs> or I'm going to hold on to this rice and beans thing. She's, are you okay, Marco? 
what's wrong, Marco? Well, you know, all I wanted, after all the years I've invested in this marriage, <laughs> and the five children that I've given you, <laughs> after all of that, all I wanted was a little plate of rice and beans, and you couldn't do that? And if you can't do that, what can you do for me? It's going to take me a while to get over this. Or I could just decide to forgive and then go to Lisa. Lisa, I realized I didn't give you, remember, I'm doing it right now. I realized I didn't give you enough time to get the rice and the beans. And I just kind of put it on you. But I forgive you, Lisa, for not cooking me rice and beans on my birthday. And I promise you I'll never bring it up again until my next sermon. No. <laughs> See how we are? See how we are? See how we are? So, because to forgive means this. I forgive you. Say, say I forgive you. It also means this. I'll never use it against you in the future. I will never speak of it again to you or anyone else. I totally let it go. I will forgive you the way God forgave me. Wow. How did God forgive me? He totally forgave me. In Psalms 103, 12 says, as far as the east is from the west, that's how far God has removed our sin from us. What it means, if you drive east, you'll always be going east. You'll never go west because east and west never meet. If you go north, you run into the North Pole and then start going south. If you go south, you run into the South Pole and start going north. But God is saying, when I forgive you, I remove it off your record to never be brought up again. It'll never catch up with you again. I'll never mention it again. And I'll never associate it with you ever again. When I forgive, I totally let it go. You might remember, but it's gone out of my mind. And what God is saying, I want you to forgive the same way. I, and so, I still remember, I know. But stop talking about it. Stop, and if you keep practicing forgiveness, sooner or later, that incident will lose its strength. You guys get that? And the last D. Someone said, last D. Do good to them and bless them. The final test that you've finally forgiven someone is not that only that you didn't do, do them wrong and you decided not to slash their tires and you decided not to poison them with a little rat poison with the, with the enchiladas. It goes much further than that. You totally turn it around. Say, say, totally turn it around. You know what you do? You find a way to speak well of them and bless them and do something good. So you might just go ahead as a husband and go and get your wife some flowers. She don't deserve no flowers. Don't worry about deserving. Just do good. You didn't deserve forgiveness and Jesus dying for you either. Just start doing good and more good's going to come. Someone has to... I want you to know my identity is to be like Christ. Be careful. Some of us are more like our enemies than we are like our Lord. Be careful because what happens when you get offended, if you don't watch it, you become like the person you hate. I'll never be like you, mama. You're exactly like her. Que pasó? You know why? You never let go of the hate. You never let go of the anger. And now you become like the person you hate. You're not supposed to become like the person that did you wrong. You're supposed to become like your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we'll end it with this scripture. Luke 6, 27 says this. Listen, all of you. Love your enemies. Love what? Do good to those who hate you. Pray for the happiness of those who curse you. Implore God's blessings on those who hurt you. And all we're saying is, whatever you do, do it in love. And don't ever let hate and anger overpower you and resentment and bitterness. Because it's going to ruin your life. It's going to ruin your emotions. It's going to ruin your future. It's going to ruin your blessings. You do have a choice. Did we learn something today about conflict resolution? Right?
Make the first move. Someone say, make the first move. And number two was begin with our faults. And number three, forgive, right? Forgive. How do we forgive? Decide to forgive. It's not an emotion. It's a choice. Declare forgiveness. Open up your mouth. Say, I forgive you for. And then do good to them. Seal that whole forgiveness with an act of benevolence, kindness, and generosity. If, I, if everyone could bow their head and close their eyes for a moment, we're just going to pray. If you need special prayer, you can come to the front. We're going to have some altar workers up here. We'd love to pray with you. You guys, tonight at 6 o'clock, we got, I think, seven, seven to nine couples, I believe it is. They're getting married tonight. So we're going to have a mass wedding. We have, I think, 100 teenagers that's going to commit themselves to God, a life of celibacy, until they get married. It's going to be awesome. Young adults are getting involved in it as well. We're going to renew vows. If you're saying, man, I, I would love to renew my vows. I've been married for a while. Maybe some things have happened. I would love for me and my wife to be able to renew our vows. You're going to get a chance to do that tonight at 6. So we'll have a time of renewing our vows. We're going to have a time mass wedding. Nine couples are getting married tonight. And then young adults, young adults, singles, you're single. We have teenagers. We're going to make a commitment of sexual purity to God tonight. So you don't want to miss it, 6 o'clock tonight. But let's bow our head and close our eyes for a moment. Maybe you're here today or maybe you're watching online. You're saying, man, I just feel the love of God. I feel the peace. And you're saying, man, I just want to surrender my life to God. This is going to be your opportunity. If you're saying, man, I want to make God the center of my life. Man, I want to make sure if I die today, I'd go straight to heaven. Or maybe I've been backslidden, but man, I need to make a new start today with God. I want you to say this prayer right there at your seat. And if you need prayer, if anyone needs prayer, at the end, you could come down. We'd love to pray with you guys. Every head by every eyes closed. If you're saying, I need God, Pastor. I need that love. I need that peace. I need that forgiveness. I want eternal life. Every head by every eyes closed. You're at home. Let's say this prayer together today. Say, Jesus, I ask forgiveness of all my sins. Jesus, come into my heart and become my Lord and Savior. From this day forward, I am a follower. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, fill me today. Set me free from all my bad habits, all my addictions. I'm a brand new person today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. How many said that prayer with us this morning, this afternoon? I see those hands. Welcome to the family of Christ. We love you guys. If anybody needs prayer, come on down. We love to pray with you guys. Our altar workers are up here. If you need anything, come on down. We'd love to pray with you. Congratulations to the beautiful couple who got married. God bless you guys. Tonight, 6 o'clock, you guys, you're married. You want to renew vows. Come. Nine couples getting married tonight. Singles, young adults, teenagers. We're going to make a vow commitment of purity to Christ tonight. God, God bless you guys. If God is for you, who could come against you? God bless you. If you need prayer, yeah, come on down. We'd love to pray with you guys. God bless.